Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now, the United Nations Human Rights Council, the organization known as the Cesspool of Bias, is beginning its 52nd session tomorrow in Geneva, Switzerland. So naturally, we as Sri Lankans would, be, would expect them to take Sri Lanka as a crucial discussion point. But to our surprise, we couldn't find anything Sri Lanka related in the current agenda. Now, it's still a draft agenda and it can change any moment, even as we speak. Now, despite our nation not being in the draft agenda, this doesn't mean Sri Lanka's resolution and progress would not be taken up. Surely it would be mentioned in the High Commissioner's report to the Council. And also, so far we might think that it will be taken up at the preliminary session of the Council. Now, but the absence of Sri Lanka being discussed extensively sheds a light on another story that needs to be told in the mainstream media. Why are we getting a free pass this time around? Is it because we are now obedient uh, supporters of the United States? And uh, is, is it because uh, we are very much implementing their needs and wants? Sadly, I have to keep mentioning the past continuously. But there was a similar situation back in 2015 where we were given a pass by the UNHRC because at that time too, the American investment, which was the good governance, just came to power. And the UNHRC said that we have to give them time to work things out. But no such luck uh, to a former President Gautabi Rajapaksa's government. In the first year, back in 2019 itself, despite being amidst a COVID pandemic, the heavily biased Michelle Bachelet was up in arms against that administration. Obviously, we know why. In case Sri Lanka is taken up, what will they discuss this time around? Uh, joining me now from the data board is Dani Duitanamasam. Dani, good to see you once again. Um, uh, I know you uh, have been looking at uh, the past resolutions and trying to understand exactly uh, what we have to deliver this time around. I think the uh, previous resolution was in somewhere around in 2022. 2020, yeah. So much just to clarify that 2022, there was an update with regards to the Human Rights Commissioner who gave an update on 46 slash 1, which is the most latest one, which I'll be looking at momentarily. What we need to understand is, Mahesh, the focus of the 2022 update was primarily on the entire regime changing initiative that went on in our country and you have uh, really covered this extensively not sure how that really relates to the human rights situation uh, back in uh, back in during the during the war against the LTTE now four uh, particular items that we see in the 16 operative clauses that have been mentioned within 46/1 one is the militarization which i will spend some time on second the erosion of the judiciary these are terms that have been used within that uh, within the document itself, then the prosecution of human rights related crimes, uh, uh, they call it some special uh, special forms of uh, cases that need to be taken up uh, initially, and the protection of civil society actors. Now the latter two, which you can understand very clearly, is something that is request, requested almost in a general basis. But we see that the militarization was an aspect that was vehemently criticized both by 46 slash 1 and by the by the um, High Commissioner's update which you were referring to in 2022, which was in October of 2022. This mentioned that about 28 appointments were made. We are not sure how these things are relevant to the mandate of the UNHRC, but we believe that these are also things that will be taken up this time session because we see that uh, things like the Chief of Staff, which is uh, General Shavendu Silva, or even uh, the or other, other security appointments have not been changed by the current administration. So definitely we expect expecting this to be taken up again. It's funny that we have to talk about the mandate of the UNHRC, uh, whereas apparently, uh, you know, uh, in, in organizations when you join, uh, you usually, uh, the human rights, uh, uh, not human rights, sorry, the human resources department, the HR department comes and gives you a little bit of a refresher saying this is our mandate, this is what we do. Perhaps I think uh, they fail to do that in the UNHRC, maybe it's due. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, as always, Dani Dutanabasam at the data board. Thank you very much. Now, the UNHRC is trying to determine whether human rights violations occurred in Sri Lanka's final phase of the war. However, this organization has a track record where certain groups can get into their system and lobby hard. Basically, they believe them for life. In Sri Lanka's case, yet the UNHRC has not determined whether war crimes occurred. They, however, wanted to punish the Rajapaksas, mainly President Mahinda Rajapaksa. Now, as things are, thanks to last year's JVP-supported unrest, they managed to get rid of them. And Canada led the way in imposing the first rounds of sanctions. 
Sri Lanka is not the only nation that has been mistreated this way. If you look at the case of Israel, they get slapped, I think, the most number of resolutions from the UNHRC. But Israel has never given two hoots about that body, not because they are correct, but because they're purely biased. Even in Sri Lanka's case, the UNHRC is more worried about how many terrorists were killed. But when it comes to the 5,000 army soldiers from Sri Lanka whose status is still unknown, UNHRC becomes deaf, blind and mute. Even the human rights jokers in Sri Lanka too can't be bothered to speak about that as they are too busy talking about the rights of disruptors. Or better yet, misdirecting your attention to the hatred they created against this country. Let's get some uh, idea as to what the UNHRC might be up to this time around. Joining me now is the president of the Society for Peace, Unity and Human Rights Organization in Australia, Dr. Dasarad Jaisuria. He's in Sri Lanka at the moment. And I got the um, opportunity to speak uh, to him. Thank you very much, uh, doctor, for your time. Now, with Sri Lanka towing the line of America and the West and putting their needs first, it might be seen that there might not be an adverse resolution passed uh, in the UNHRC this time around. But learning from past experiences, uh, whenever there was a similar situation, like back in the good governance days, Sri Lanka became a sponsor of the resolution 30-1, which allowed foreign judges to interfere in Sri Lankan process. So what is your reading on this time situation? Uh, that's a very good question, Mahesh. Uh, it reminds me of uh, uh, a, uh, a few words that were spoken by the uh, the Trojan priest of Poseidon, uh, Lacon, who basically said that don't uh, trust the horse and don't uh, have faith in the people who bear gifts, because I don't trust the Greek. In this case, the Greek has to be the Greeks have to be replaced by the Americans, and there's no point in compromising like what we've done in the past. We should stand on principles. I think there are five points that I would like to quickly go through. One is the illegality of the whole process that has gone through because the UN resolution uh, in the General Assembly talks about these universal periodic reviews as the mechanism for investigations such as these and uh, that any such reviews has to be done in collaboration. Unfortunately, we have been uh, marked to have an individual investigation as a country and that is reserved for places like in Ukraine, when uh, in Ukraine, when there are major violations of human rights and they have used this as a tool to beat up Sri Lanka. And the second point is that the Ban Ki-moon report, the YSL, is also a personal report that had been commissioned by the then uh, the head of the Human Rights Commission. And then subsequently, the erroneous data that the 40,000 people died, when they have very strong evidence to say that there was only 8,136 people who died. Global Sri Lanka Forum has done a, uh, a very deep research into that. And we can see that, that that's, the, that that's, the, that's the status. The third point is that when you look at the, the resolution that passed in uh, uh, 2015, uh, there has been a mechanism that has been set up to investigate Sri Lankans and collate and archive the data so that they can go on a subsequent time and have some prosecutions uh, against individuals. And I think that is, uh, that is not uh, the right thing to do. And of course, uh, in the last resolution that was in 2020, uh, there were issues with expanding the scope into economic crimes. And, uh, and I think that is a, a, a terrible extension of the jurisdiction by the Human Rights Commission. Indeed, uh, Doctor. Now, whatever uh, is said and done, we really need to and be really honest in uh, finding a solution to the reconciliation process in order to address the real concerns of our fellow Tamil community. Now, in your opinion, what is the best way that uh, we can address that? I think that is a fallacy to say that it's only the Tamils that have uh, uh, issues in Sri Lanka. All Sri Lankans, irrespective of any ethnic community, whether it's the Tamil, Sinhalese, Muslim, Burger, or whatever, Malays, we all have issues. And those issues have to be addressed as Sri Lankans. There are three or four issues that our Tamil uh, uh, politicians use and raise uh, to keep uh, the separatist agenda alive. One is the so-called homeland concept, which has been uh, debunked by uh, many, many uh, historians. I like to uh, also point out to the thesis of Kaduresu, uh, uh, Kaduresu Murugeswaran, whose uh, actually his thesis talks about the kingdom in Jaffna, the Sri Lankan kings, the singular kings ruling Jaffna. 
and then also that this discriminatory issue uh, is i think is is, uh, is 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 a fallacy as well because the discrimination when you think about is it happens everywhere at every level the law is not applied uniformly to the people so that itself is a discrimination the fourth point the third point is the the aspirations of tamils i think the aspirations should be for all sri lankans we as sri lankans bereft of any ethnicity uh, of whether it is sinhalese tamils muslims malays we all have aspirations and all those aspirations have to be uh, you know listened to by government and start working towards achieving those aspirations unfortunately the tamil uh, politicians have converted this into a tamil issue as if these issues are only relevant to the tamil people and uh, when you look at the application of the uh, the the language and it is actually the singalese who have been discriminated because except for the seven districts where singalese has been given as the language of administration in the north and the east tamil is used as the administration languages and we can't even go to a court and present our case in singalese or even in english indeed uh, understood uh, doctor now the sri lankan government has been very lethargic and ineffective when it comes to fighting the propaganda of the ltt how can that be addressed in your opinion well i think uh, the first thing to do is to develop a national policy it was tony abbott the former prime minister of australia who said that national security is integral to economic prosperity and when the separatist agenda although militarily defeated is in a covert way been prosecuted by uh, the uh, the the tamil diaspora who still remnants of the ltte not all all diaspora i should say but the ltte diaspora and also the tamil politicians who are prosecuting separatism we need to confront that by having a uniform policy uh, uh, that spans across all political divide and we as uh, overseas sri lankans who are promoting national unity territorial integrity uh, and the sovereignty of sri lanka uh, would like to will always collaborate with that the second point is that we should set up a desk uh, for expatriates to focus on this issue and work on it because uh, we have the recent uh, uh, shenanigans that happened in toronto in canada where a, a, a council unilaterally declared a genocidal week things like issues like that we need to be proactive and deal with it in a much more comprehensive and a, and a collaborative way with people living overseas the canadian sri lankans who are pro sri lanka the the third point that i would like to say is that we should uh, we should uh, repeal any laws that is leading towards separatism like the 13th amendment because as long as that goes on there is always the pushing the boundaries towards more and more uh, independence the the all of these accusations can be rebutted against our sri lankan soldiers and the un resolutions by using the two documents that have been produced by the global sri lanka forum uh, which is uh, the rebuttal document against uh, the accusations that there are two uh, volumes that have been published and all the information are available and we would like to collaborate and participate and support the sri lanka government as expected sri lanka sasper global sri lanka forum and also the expected uh, sri lankan federation of uh, Uh, Sri Lankan communities. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. We had to leave it at that. That was the president of the Society for Peace, Unity, and Human Rights Organization in Australia, Dr. Dasara Jayasuriya. Well, Canada is another culprit that is battering Sri Lanka by only listening to the LTTE propaganda. At least uh, in the UNHRC, there's some fairness in voicing our concerns, but not in Canada. The sadder your storytelling ability is, the better your chances of fooling them. So obviously, the Canadian government has fallen for the utter bull and the Academy Award winning sob story foretold by the LTT propaganda arm in Canada and has imposed sanctions on two former presidents of our country. So what will they be up to this time around? Joining me now uh, is Professor and Research Fellow of the International Centre for Interdisciplinary Research in Law at the Laurentian University, Canada, Professor Neville Hevage. Good to see you once again, Professor. Thank you for joining me. Uh, he joins me uh, now via Zoom from Toronto, Canada. Professor, uh, 
I wanted to ask you uh, with regard to this UNHRC session this time around, the 52nd one. Uh, even though no proper agenda item is mentioned in the UNHRC on Sri Lanka, we still need to find out what countries like Canada are planning behind the scenes. Since Sri Lanka is an obedient child of the U.S., we might uh, get a pass this time around. What do you think the Canadian gov government is cooking up based on the propaganda by the LTTE? Thank you very much, Mahesh, uh, to invite me for this interview. Uh, so this question, I need to start from the beginning. And what is the UNHRC role? UNHRC role is an advisory role, and they cannot uh, implement any punitive measures. And that uh, recommendation, they can implement with the consent. Now we need to find out who are the people behind this uh, core group, I mean, uh, resolution against the Sri Lanka. Core group is uh, consists with the, uh, mainly from uh, United States and Canada and UK. Pretty much there is a more power on the Western Bloc. Now we need to find out why Western Bloc is more concerned and interested about in Sri Lanka like a small country. And we have 21 million, we don't have oil. So we don't have economic, any resources, why they are so important. And uh, Western Bloc wants to uh, get ready in the Pacific region, military ready uh, against some other threat. Specifically, they are referring according to the, our research work and the, against the China. So now because of the, they want to against the military readiness, and they need to in, uh, influence the Sri Lankan government and other parties to get their things done. Actually, now what is happened, now we need to find out what is the LTT role here. LTT role is mainly is coming with the, their propaganda campaign. And their propaganda campaign is mainly accountability and accountability message. And uh, so in that case, it, they want to... Uh, force the other parties in uh, Canada and other parties to get some action against the Sri Lanka. So by doing this one, they are using human rights mechanism as a tool, political tool, to force the Sri Lanka to get military readiness for their campaign. That's what the Canada's plan, and that's what the Western uh, ideology plan, Western group is trying to achieve that one. They are not really interested about the Tamil issue in Sri Lanka. Ultimate goal is to military readiness program in the Indo-Pacific region. That's what the Canada is planning and the behind. But in order to achieve that, they are putting uh, accountability measures and pressurizing the country to get into that part. Understood. Uh, now, Professor, in Canada, what do you think uh, the LTT propaganda arm hopes to achieve after having succeeded in fooling the people of the state of Ontario, what are they up to now? Uh, but actually, uh, uh, but I do not agree with they are fooling the people in Ontario. It is a very uh, LTT propaganda uh, that created the uh, different kind of uh, face to people to show what's happening with the in Sri Lanka. Completely a different thing. But the people understand that Canadian government also not recognized Sri Lanka, what they are complaining, and they understood that as a, uh, they send us a, uh, they send a diplomatic note and uh, referring uh, Sri Lanka issue as a civil conflict or armed conflict. And uh, then by the same time, and uh, military readiness program is there, and uh, that is also leaked cable from uh, US Embassy, and it is also there. Now, LTT want to achieve uh, uh, the, their propaganda. First propaganda campaign is that Tamils are innocent victim of the government of Sri Lanka. And second campaign is for their campaign, second element of their campaign, uh, Sri Lankan Tamils subject to constant discrimination and military oppression. So by adding all those things and what they are going to do and they want to establish and they want to precedent, say that Sri Lanka is no best place to live in Tamils in uh, Tamil. By, by propaganda purpose, and they want to get more refugees to the Western country. Refugee business is the behind this, all the scandals. And uh, one of the refugees coming to Canada paid 30, 35,000 getting into the board. And once they landed here, they had to pay another $35,000 for the LTT operatives here. 
So main idea is that to influence the asylum policy in Canada to get more refugees to Canada. In that case, they can uh, build up their revenue. So it's a business. It's a completely uh, business, refugee business. That's what they want. They are going to achieve. And these individuals has no whatsoever is a concern about Sri Lankan Tamils. And they want to establish Sri Lanka is an unstable country, no good for the Tamil. Then bring the whatever things, uh, Tamil refugees to Canada and uh, make their money. So that's a propaganda campaign. And uh, that is the money making machine. And uh, Minister of the uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, Melanie Jolie, and she knows very well about those things. Uh, I have a reasonable ground to believe she knows, but she also playing the political game to get the and satisfy the uh, Tamil dice for us, uh, you know, uh, water base. So that's what is happening in, in, in Canada. Absolutely. Education is the only way that we can keep these people informed about the real situation. Well, thank you. That was the professor and research fellow of the International Centre for Interdisciplinary Research in Law at the Laurentian University of Canada, Professor Neville Hevigay. Appreciate your time. Now, before we take a short uh, commercial break, I want to know what the government hopes to do this time around. For that, I spoke to the State Minister of Foreign Affairs, Tharaka Balasuriya. Watch. Uh, there will be an oral update uh, in, uh, pertaining to Sri Lanka, uh, pertaining to uh, the, um, the human rights, uh, the reconciliation and uh, uh, the economic crisis, uh, which, was, uh, which was all stated in the, uh, the and economic crimes also, which was all stated in the uh, 50, 51st uh, session. Uh, but as far as the uh, overall um, the Human Rights Council is concerned, the, the government has been making taking uh, uh, very many policies in the right direction. Uh, after the new president came into power, the 21st Amendment was passed. Uh, uh, there were there are then uh, prior to that even we had made some amendments to the uh, the prevention of terrorism act uh, we will hopefully bring a new bill before the uh, the end of first quarter uh, and also um, uh, there's other efforts uh, pertaining to reconciliation uh, the president has had an all party conference uh, uh, which deals with the question of power devolution uh, and uh, also um, uh, the the foreign ministry together with the uh, the presidential secretary uh, secretariat is uh, uh, is formulating uh, overseas sri lankan's office uh, we have uh, already um, hired a um, uh, director general uh, and uh, also uh, there are other steps such as uh, uh, establishing of uh, overseas Sri Lankan's office, which will initially come under the presidential secretariat, but uh, later on under the uh, foreign ministry. Uh, but as far as the overall strategy is concerned, I think the strategy can be uh, divided into uh, three areas. Uh, one is we need to really uh, reach out to uh, the um, uh, the uh, the the diaspora, the Sri Lankans out over there, there's a uh, misunderstanding of uh, what's actually happening. Uh, uh, there's almost a, a myth that uh, the, the, the Sri Lankans uh, in Sri Lanka that the, uh, the, um, uh, the Sri Lankans are not living together. The, the, there's, uh, uh, it's almost portrayed as that uh, everybody is killing one another. There are certain uh, uh, measures which we need to do in order to, uh, of course, build rec reconciliation. And we need to work on those things, including uh, devolution. Uh, but uh, certainly, I think, you know, we need to reach out to the diaspora. So the diaspora pressure on uh, other governments would, uh, would be uh, uh, minimized. Well, that was uh, the State Minister of Foreign Affairs, Tarak Balasuri, explaining as to what the Sri Lankan government hopes to do at the UNHRC this time around. Now, we're going to take a short commercial break. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment.